president of the Westmoreland Area Community Organization, uh, otherwise known as WACO. And I would like to uh, welcome all of you uh, here this evening to the Ward 3 Candidates Forum. Uh, only in uh, Tacoma Park on April Fool's Day uh, <laughs> would an organization named WACO uh, be sponsoring a forum to uh, learn about candidates running for political office in our city. And uh, we're, we're delighted to join with uh, the Circle Woods Community Association, uh, as well as with the uh, Tacoma Voice uh, in sponsoring uh, this forum tonight to try to provide for a more informed electorate in order for you and everyone watching on, on cable to be able to exercise an informed choice on Election Day, uh, one week from today as well as early voting that begins uh, several days before that. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more about the early voting procedures uh, later this evening. Uh, I'd like to particularly thank the three candidates who've stepped forward to, uh, to run for, uh, for office uh, in Ward 3, representing Ward 3. It's a, it's a delight that we have uh, three uh, specially qualified candidates like each of you in running for office. And uh, it doesn't matter who among you wins, we're delighted that all three of you have chosen to run for office and, uh, and to give the voters of Ward 3 uh, a choice uh, in a truly democratic contest. So thank you very much for, for, your, for your civic labors. We appreciate that. And we're also delighted that, that Bill Brown of the Tacoma Voice has uh, stepped forward to once again serve as moderator for tonight's program. Uh, Bill will be covering uh, the rules, covering uh, uh, the discussion. We hope this is an interactive event and that you will leave here tonight uh, feeling more informed about the choice that you have to make as well as uh, even prouder of the city that we're uh, privileged to, to live in. So thank you for being here. And with that, we'll turn the program over to Mr. Bill Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce Moyer. Welcome to the uh, Ward 6 Special Election Candidates Forum. Uh, as uh, Bruce said, I'm Bill Brown, Managing Editor of the Tacoma Voice. And the Tacoma Voice has a voter's guide you might want to look at as well as watch this forum. And uh, we're at www.tacoma.com. That's Tacoma with a K. <laughs> the, um, uh, the city's website also has an election page there at uh, www.tacomaparkmd.gov. This special election was called uh, to complete the second term of the late Ward 3 council person, who was uh, Kay Daniels Cohen. She unfortunately passed away in uh, February, and just three months after she had been elected for her second term. Uh, th this term uh, expires in 2016, so the, the, there are several, uh, several months left. Excuse me, 200, 2015, thank you. Uh, the, um, I'm pleased to introduce the three candidates running for the Ward 3 City Council seat. And after I introduce them, I will go through some of the uh, rules and announcements, so bear with me. So first we have uh, Roger Schlegel. Jeffrey Noel Nussbaum, and Kate Stewart. And I saw them at the uh, VFW forum last weekend, and uh, I, I have to say this is going to be a very difficult choice. And I, I'd like to thank all of you for, for stepping forward and running. Thank it's you. a great uh, service to the city. Thank you. Um, so the format is going to go like this. Each candidate will have a three-minute opening statement. Following that, they will answer questions. The time allowed for answers will be reasonably loose, but if it gets much longer than three minutes, uh, or if the speaker seems to run out of steam, I'll signal the candidate <laughs> to wrap up. Um, <clears throat> we'll rotate the beginning order of candidates with each question. Uh, people who have a question can come up to the lectern, which is that construction over there. If you are unable to come up to the lectern, raise your hand and we'll pass you a microphone. It is important to speak into a microphone so people watching can hear your question. So if you stand up and start talking from your seat, the uh, audience watching will not be able to hear you. Um, 
the technical crew requests that we have no more than two to three people lined up to ask questions. So no, no traffic jams, please. And please keep your questions short if you can. Um, I'd like to make some general announcements before the, uh, the main event. Uh, the election is Tuesday, May 8th. The polls open at... April 8th. <laughs> I'm glad they're here. April 8th. <laughs> polls open at 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at, listen carefully, the Tacoma Park Fire Station, 7201 Carroll Avenue. There's no election uh, here on election day. If you come here, they'll stare at you and wonder what the heck you're doing here. Uh, there is early voting here, Sunday, April 6th, and Monday, April 7th. On Sunday, the polls open at 12 noon and close at 4. On Monday, the polls open at 4 and close at 8. And that's in the senior room at the Computer Learning Center. Did I get that right? Okay. You'll find out when you get here. Um, absentee ballots. Uh, they, must, they can be filed April 2nd through Tuesday, April 8th. Must be received by the city clerk prior to the official closing of the polls on the day of the election. See, see the Woody city website for more details. Um, a note on parking when you go to vote at the Tacoma Park Fire Station. Um, it's, when you face the fire station, it's on your right because a ramp down to the, to the uh, parking lot, and the parking is in a door back there. So don't go to the front door. You'll get run over by a fire truck. Uh, the, um, so there's, there, there will be a dozen parking spaces made available. If for any strange reason it's overcrowded, you can go to the city lot, which is on the other side of the fire station. So <clears throat> if you're still awake, uh, we'd like to have opening statements, and we're going to start with Roger, Roger Schlegel. Thank you, Bill, and thank you to WACO and Circle Woods and The Voice for sponsoring this event. So my name is Roger Schlegel, and I have to say that having testified there so many times, it's kind of funny to be thinking that we're auditioning in reality for council seats, um, and <laughs> I'll try to act like a good council member and keep things as briefly as I can. So my name is Roger Schlegel. My family consists of my wife, Sasha Place, and my children, Theo and Ainsley, and our two cats. We live on Allegheny Avenue on a great block in the neighborhood of Pinecrest, which also overlaps with Wacko on that block. We are founding members of the community garden and love it there. I'm a high school teacher. I've been so for 20 years. I teach English. I've taught geography. I'll be teaching psychology next year. I've directed many plays and musicals and I'm an amateur musician. I grew up in DC. I have an MA in English and an MPA in local government, so I'm an eclectic person. <laughs> Prior to teaching, I worked in local government in DC and in North Carolina, and I also worked for a diversity training nonprofit in Anacostia. Uh, también hablo español, and if anyone is watching who speaks Spanish at home, uh, quiero hacer, establecer, Muchas oportunidades para participación, para participación de uh, gente que hablan otras lenguas en casa. So I want to increase opportunities for people to participate who speak other languages. Uh, my website is rogertacoma.com. My goal tonight is to open your mind and convince you that I'm the strongest candidate to represent Ward 3 right now in finishing out Kay's term. One minute. What distinguishes me is my ability to make progress happen and the fact that I have the experience over the past five years of making progress happen locally here in Tacoma Park in many ways. I've assisted OTBA in publicizing their market analysis. I've been a co-president of the cooperative school. I served on the junction task force and the city manager selection task force. And I've been an avid member of the Pinecrest Community Association. You'll hear about all those things. My personal qualities I want to bring out tonight are that I'm fair-minded, focused, I'm friendly, and I insist on following through with things. My particular issues of importance are infrastructure and public safety in our neighborhoods, program-based budgeting and resolving tax duplication, 
climate change as a capstone issue that can help us achieve many of our aspirations Time. and Tacoma Junction. Time. I'll ask for your vote. Thank you. Okay. Jeffrey. Noel Hi, Nussbaum. my name is Jeffrey Noel Nussbaum. I uh, grew up here in Tacoma Park. I was born in 1982, and so except for, with the exception of less than two years, I've spent that entire time living in Tacoma Park and in, specifically in Ward 3. I've lived in uh, the Circle Woods neighborhood by Spring Park on Cockerell Avenue. I have lived on Eastern Avenue and the Garden Apartments, the Eastern Garden Apartments there, just by behind uh, the Old Town. And I currently live on Manor Circle over by the co-op. So I have lived all over the ward. And I've, my parents, you know, were homeowners when I lived down in uh, Circle Woods. And I've been a renter the rest of the time. I uh, want to th definitely want to thank Waco and uh, Circle Woods for sponsoring this forum and the voice as well. The... Uh, the involvement I've had in the city has included uh, going to all three public schools here, Tacoma Park Elementary, Tacoma Park Middle, and Piney Branch Elementary. I was a member of Boy Scout Troop 33 under Don Patty, who the uh, gym at Tacoma Park Presbyterian Church is named after. In fact, I've been very involved in Tacoma Park Presbyterian Church over the years, and I will be helping out with the bazaar this Saturday. <laughs> I definitely grew up using the resources at the library very much. And so all of those things make show that I have Tacoma Park in my DNA. In addition, I, my whole career has pretty much been in public service. The only time, job I've had that wasn't in public service was at Taliano's before it closed. I have, uh, and only one, really one of my uh, Public service jobs have not has not been in the government. That was with the nonprofit sector. I'm currently a employee of the Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services. I have volunteered eight years with the Silver Spring Tacoma Thunderbolts as a scorekeeper. I was an election judge for the city in 2003, 2005, 2013, and the Ward 5 special election in 2012. I served on the city's board of elections last year and the year before, 2012 and 13, and I helped implement the new election rules in our last election. And I've also was one of the board of elections representatives and a co-chair of the task force on voting that the city has created. I accomplish things by listening to others, thinking deeply about issues, and working to ensure thoughtful and efficient action. I'm comfortable in the world of ideas, and you can tr trust me to take a balanced approach. I love Tacoma Park and I stay here because of how active our people are and I'm young enough to bring us fresh perspective. I think all these factors would lead me to work with all city stakeholders Time. and not just activists. Time. Thank you. And now Kate Stewart. Yep. Great. Thank you everyone tonight for coming tonight. You all know because you're here and you wouldn't be here if you didn't know that Tacoma Park is an amazing wonderful place to live and I feel really very lucky to be here. My husband John and I came here 20 years ago and we rented over on Philadelphia Avenue and then we purchased our home on the corner of Elm and Sycamore where I live with John and my two daughters. I love living in Tacoma Park and part of loving that is the community service that I've been able to be involved with over the years with members of the community, my neighbors, and members of the city council, I've been lucky enough to start up a safety patrol in our neighborhood, to start the BF Gilbert listserv. Um, I remember fondly building the playground in Spring Park and praying that it would stay up after my children played on it. Um, the thing I right now that I enjoy the most is uh, coaching soccer, and thankfully we will not have another so snowy Sunday afternoon and we'll actually get to coach. Um, the experience I bring to this uh, position, I would like to bring to this position, is that for two decades I was a small business owner and then um, I've now moved on to be the executive vice president of a nonprofit called Advocates for Youth. In my job at Advocates, I oversee a large staff, a multi-million dollar budget, and complex projects. I think those are the skills that we need on our city council right now as we think about the opportunities and challenges that are facing our community. I kind of think about what we're going to be facing in the next couple of years in three buckets. 
The first is making sure we maintain our unique character and quality of life here in Tacoma Park. That means the City Council needs to work with neighbors, members of the uh, Old Town Business Association, and businesses as they come into our community. So that as we revitalize Tacoma Junction, New Hampshire Avenue, and downtown Tacoma, we don't become a Bethesda light or a theme park of ourselves, but that we maintain our unique character. One minute. The second big bucket of issues is building our sustainable future. I think for too long we've kind of rested on our reputation on the environment and it's time we need to walk the walk again. We need to do things like invest in solar and um, incentives for solar and home installation projects and other things. We have a lot of expertise in the city and particularly in Ward 3 on environmental issues and we need to tap into that. It also means making sure we have opportunities for young people across the city. When we think about a sustainable future, all our young people need opportunities. And as people grow older in our community, they need to be able to stay here in their homes. The third big bucket is making sure we have a safe and welcoming community. And that means better coordination with the police department and better communication. These are just some of the things, in addition to maintaining our parks, our sidewalks, our infrastructure, that we need to be addressing in the next few months and the next couple of years to make sure Tacoma Time. stays the ha place we want to stay. Well done. All right, thank you very much. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to insert myself just once <laughs> in this process, and I have a question. Uh, this, was, this was brought up to me after the uh, VFW forum to uh, an issue that a couple of people had wished had been talk covered. Uh, and that issue is uh, tax duplication. So uh, I'm going to ask you that question, but I'm, first I'm going to give a tutorial on <laughs> tax duplication. Uh, I think this is a very important issue. And it's often misunderstood. And there is a general impression that the city isn't doing enough on this issue. Uh, it's not so much in this election, uh, but in others, candidates have complained that the council wasn't doing enough, and if elected, they would jump in and grab the bull by the horns and solve that, that issue right away. Um, so as a public service, I would like to give you this, uh, this little explanation about double taxation and where it now stands. In a nutshell, uh, the county takes taxes for services it doesn't provide. The city provides those services which taxpayers already pay for. The city says the county should reimburse more to the city for those service costs. And we're talking about police, uh, public works, library, uh, uh, recreation, things like that. Um, property tax is the main problem. A big chunk goes to the county. The city adds a tax on top of that. The city says it would not have to take so much if the county fairly reimbursed us. The formulas and calculations the county uses are arbitrary, and everyone agrees, including the county, that they're no longer accurate. Our city council, our city staff, and our county representatives have been working on this for years. There has been no lack of effort. The solution, they feel, is a political one, not a legal one, i.e. taking the county to court. The county has been studying this, and last year, the county's Office of Legislative Oversight, Oversight OLO, released a report on county municipal tax duplication, commonly called the OLO report. Generally, Tacoma Park and other municipalities did not like most of their recommendations. The city sent a strongly worded letter to the county committee dealing with the issue. The latest is that after the primaries in late June coming up, a committee will meet to work out some other solutions. The group includes representatives from municipalities, including our own um, Deputy, uh, city Deputy Manager Suzanne Ludlow. So really, there's not much else that individual city council members can do except keep up the pressure. So given those facts, please tell me, please address the issue of um, tax duplication. And we'll go to the next person to start first. All right. Uh, I think, yeah, that was just a great uh, summary there. So I just want to say... Um, I definitely agree that there is minimal things that the council can do in terms of putting pressure directly on the county council members at this point. We have done that a lot. Uh, there are a lot of county council members who live in Tacoma Park and other municipalities and understand the issue to a certain extent. 
but they also represent areas that are not municipalities. And in Montgomery County, that's the majority of the county is not is not incorporated as a city or a town. So part of what we need to do is to make sure that the rest of the population in those areas understands the issue because there is because when we do that that will allow to a certain extent a reduction in pressure from constituents in those areas from pressuring the county council not to give us our fair share of t of uh, money back from tax duplication because currently since they don't understand it they they look at it as a subsidy they're giving to us when in reality it's cutting back on a subsidy that we're giving to them so if we if we can put something out publicly and do a public education campaign to a certain extent I think we can make that clear and then the other thing that does is a lot of people in the county do know people who live in municipalities and so if, if they know that then they'll also might there might be something where it's not just reducing the pressure on the other side but some of them might want to support their friends and family so they would then you know that live in municipalities so then they would actually be on on our side and actually we'd have support from outside the municipalities on this issue as well so basically as I'm saying I think we've reached pretty close to the limit on what we can do with county officials and state officials I think a lot of it at this point needs to be making sure that people who live in non-incorporated areas understand the issue or understand it better than they do now so that we can have a better road in terms of support for for public uh, county officials that want to support us but have a certain pressure not to do so currently thank you um, well Bill I think you uh, got it right when you said this is actually a political issue and there's a lot of politics involved here and I think in the short term one of the things that particularly voters can do over be, as the primary approaches and people are running for county council is putting pressure on those uh, candidates so that they know to get a vote from Tacoma Park they have to take a public stand on um, tax duplication that's one thing I think we can all do in the near term um, the second thing is um, having somebody on the city council to augment the skills of the folks who are already on the city council. I know members of the city council now spend a great deal of time lobbying, working, and trying to resolve this issue. Bringing more skills of somebody who understand politics and who's lobbied before, I think would augment that. I have those skills. I, in my organization right now, Advocates for Youth, I oversee the public policy department. That means I set the strategy for our federal legislative work. I have experience working on the Hill and lobbying for issues. In my, you know, Advocates for Youth, I work on young people and sexual health, and that's the issue I lobby on. So bring on tax duplication, because I think one of the hardest things to talk about is young people and their sexual health. Um, so <laughs> I would I, it'd be an interesting debate. Um, the other thing that's the final thing is I know Hans Riemer and some other folks have been talking about a grant program, um, because they said, you know, in Tacoma Park, even if we uh, receive the money back, we're at a disadvantage in how much money the county gives us compared to other municipalities in the county. Um, given our tax base here. Uh, I think that's an interesting idea, but I'm also wondering if it's just throwing us a bone and whether or not we, it is a political trick, so something to look at. Um, so. Okay, Roger? When I was running for mayor in 2009, uh, a county council member sat down with me and said, Tacoma Park's interest in resolving the tax duplication issue is a joke with the county council. They shouldn't expect it to ever go anywhere. Uh, I appreciate your summary of the issue, and I agree with Jeffrey and with Kate that uh, lobbying of residents outside municipalities, um, continuing to pursue the political and lobbying efforts, and talking to candidates in the upcoming elections and subsequent elections are all important strategies. I do think that we should capitalize on our reputation as a slightly wild and crazy municipality, though. And uh, I remember talking to Jay about this a, a few months ago. In addition, as another prong in this effort, I think that there are interesting ways that we can apply additional public pressure in Rockville. One thing I would like to 
see is a march on Rockville with pitchforks and torches <laughs> in a really theatrical Tacoma Park way that would be taken with humor. So it wouldn't be, as some people say, biting the hand that feeds us. But it would really call attention and revitalize the urgency of this. I've read the OLO report and the letter from the council, and it's, what Bill didn't say is that the, the OLO outcome is actually to reduce our reimbursement. Uh, in addition, I'd be interested in seeing if any private residents would like to try to file a class action lawsuit for uh, in, in small claims court. Maybe individuals could try that to say, you've taken my money and you haven't given me any services for it. And last, there's some interesting possibilities emerging for a, a legal challenge to this under constitutional law. <clears throat> First off, it is double taxation if we can find a way to define it. And I know that Senator Raskin has offered to do some pro bono work as a constitutional lawyer. And secondly, just this month, just last month, in a case uh, called Wynn versus State of Maryland, uh, it's a complicated issue, which I won't get into here, but um, someone trying to be reimbursed for income earned while out of the state uh, was only being reimbursed um, state, the state portion of his taxes rather than the county as well portion of his taxes. And the Supreme Court is taking some interest in this as to whether that, whether local taxes and local tax collection policy by states could be um, something regulated regulated under the Interstate Commerce Clause. So I'm very interested to see if we can pursue that channel. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Um, it's time for you to ask your questions. Uh, if you have a question, please come down to the lectern. And if you don't, it's going to be a very short meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and if somebody has a question, then get in line. Uh oh. <laughs> Thank you all for running. Uh, I'm Beth Baker. I live on Sherman Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, those of us on Sherman Avenue, as well as other neighborhoods, are um, forming loose-knit networks to help each other age mm -hmm. in Tacoma Park. And um, I'd like to hear from you all. Well, I know the city has committed to a half-time, mm -hmm. I believe, temporary position uh, on this issue, and I'd like to know how committed you all are that to all of us staying here till the end, mm -hmm. and if you had any strategies for how the city government could help us do that. Great. Thank you. So we'll start with uh, Kate. Great. Great. Thank you, Beth, so much. Um, well, as I said in um, my opening remarks, I believe that building a sustainable future here in Tacoma Park includes making sure that as people age, they can do so safely in, their, in this community. Um, I'm very dedicated to this issue. Um, my mother-in-law lives on Grant Avenue. Um, my in-laws actually moved here before we did, and that was one of the attractions for me was to move here, um, even though my husband couldn't understand why. <laughs> um, and my mother-in-law is in her early 70s now. She lives alone in her home, um, and she loves it there, and we love having her there. Um, one of the things that I think we need to be very committed to is making sure that there are programs uh, in the city, that we have accessibility to services. Um, and so, like, one example, um, my mother-in-law um, loves the Zumba class here that the rec center offers. Uh, one of the things I think that is very good is the rec center, um, in order for folks uh, who have computers or don't uh, to register, you can't register online. So you have to come early to register for Zumba class. And she knows this, and she came down uh, a couple weeks ago when registration opened. She came down early. And she said, well, it was a good thing because this time the rec department remembered to put out chairs. Last time they didn't remember to put out chairs, and when the seniors all came to sign up, they were all standing out there for a while. Well, she came early, and she still got the last seat, the last spot in the Zumba class. And she said there was another man standing next to her who had never used computers before. And he was so excited to sign up for a class to learn about computers and how to email to his grandchildren. Um, I think we have, a, we have great rec services. I'd like to see those continued. 
Um, the other thing we need to carefully look at, and I'm glad the city is hiring a part-time person. Um, my understanding from the city council meeting that I attended last night, that there is a person, we're just kind of waiting for references to be finalized and they'll be on board, which I think is great. Um, I think we have to pay close attention to, uh, as the hospital moves out, what services are left behind there to make sure that there are services uh, for seniors in our community and to make sure they can access easily those services. Um, so those are some of the things, but it's absolutely an issue I'm very committed to. Yeah. Roger? Uh, Beth, thank you for your question. Uh, I think the issue of being able to age in Tacoma is very important, especially given the demographics of our community. Uh, my mom lives in Riderwood Village. Um, I know that there's at least one other person here whose mother lives there. And uh, I'm one of the primary people looking after her as her mobility declines and she needs more help. And it, it is hard to drive out there on a weeknight to assist her. Uh, I, I want to see a way that it, when people want to downsize their homes, Perhaps they can do that by having accessory apartments and remaining in place, or maybe we can take advantage of coming development opportunities along New Hampshire Avenue and that corridor, or perhaps in if the underused school site at the end of Woodland becomes available at the end of Poplar, maybe that kind of area could be opened up as a way to live in town. Um, in the short term, I think we can do some practical things to help people. Um, I'm interested in creating some youth employment opportunities by um, fostering the development of a delivery service company that's local to Tacoma Park. So it would keep dollars spent in town and it would be a great starting job for local youth. Um, I'm also interested in promoting the formation of a loop shuttle, which has been recommended by the Environmental Task Force, a couple of loop shuttles emanating from Tacoma Junction heading out to the Metro, Montgomery College, back down uh, Flower, and then going out to Langley Park to the <coughs> grocery, and coming back down New Hampshire and back in on Ethan Allen. Um, making that a regularly scheduled service um, would be very helpful for people. Access to Washington Adventist Hospital services is hugely important, and if I'm elected, I'll, I'll continue to advocate strongly for the optimal outcome there. Uh, I'd also just like to add, as Beth, as you said, that you're trying to knit together a network in, on Sherman Avenue. I think neighborhood scale cohesion is something that we really need to foster, and the small community grant program is a great way to do that. In Pinecrest, lots of times when we start a meeting, we just talk about, well, who needs help? Uh, how is so-and-so doing on the corner there? Has anybody checked in on him recently? And we, we have that network of informal sharing if there's an emergency or a snowstorm or something, we know who we need to check on. We're getting better at that. We have a long way to go. Last thing, um, we have a lot of um, early childhood programs in Tacoma Park, and I think senior bringing, finding ways to bring seniors into linkages with those programs would be a fun thing all around for everybody. Thanks. Thank you. you guys are really good at sticking to three minutes or below. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you're going to fit into the current city council. <laughs> um, so uh, Wait, line up, still, ask I questions. Still, I still Jeffrey, have to answer. Jeffrey has to what? answer. What? Jeffrey has to answer. I haven't answer. answered. No, I'm sure you have. No, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I certainly uh, agree with a lot of the points uh, that both uh, Kate and uh, Roger made. Uh, I I just want to make some additional points. Uh, that are important to me. Um, one is, I think, it's not just, I don't think it's just seniors or just youth or just young people. I think it's all age groups. And uh, one thing I've noticed, having grown up here, you know, I'm one of very few people, you know, that I remember from my cohort who are still here, and I want to make sure that our youth remain as well, you know, as people, you know, appreciate the community we have here and stay you know, and lay down those roots, that also increases the ability of every, everyone to build networks that help everyone to be able to live in the city and remain in the city from seniors on down. I'm also, uh, there are also a lot of our seniors who are in the apartments, and I think a lot of the city services uh, that the city does on renter services, you know, certainly 
could be expanded, but I think they're doing a lot of good things there in terms of making sure that uh, the landlords and tenants are working together to make sure that the apartments in the city are livable places for everyone. So I think that's important as well. So and again, uh, those are just the things that I wanted to add in on that point. But beyond that, you know, I think I don't want to take too much time saying the same things Kate and Roger did. <laughs> It's hard going last. Yeah, yeah it's going to be there. <laughs> right, thank, yeah, I know. Well, that's why we rotate. Yeah. So, you really, line up. Line up. It, it uh, saves time if people are uh, lined up. Hi, I'm Chris Moriarty. I live on Spring Avenue in the Circle Woods neighborhood. I have a question related to the paper newsletter. Let me start off by saying I'm very happy that the city undertakes the expense to send it out because it goes to all addresses, including those that have limited or no Internet access. I have a concern, though, that city departments are perhaps not using the newsletter as effectively as they could to communicate to the city residents, the Public Works Department in particular. So I'm wondering if you share the concern that I have, and if so, what are you planning to do to talk to city departments to make sure that they're using the city newsletter as effectively as they could to communicate to the city? Thank you. I think we're back to Roger, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so, Chris? I appreciate your question. Um, I would simply say that it starts by thinking about the, there are three tiers of participation in our community. There are the people who are highly, highly involved, like many of you <laughs> who have come out tonight. And they're on the listservs. They're making phone calls. They're having meetings in their own homes. They come out. Then there are people who show up for important events or important issues that are going to affect them in their neighborhoods. Um, for people like that, it's Im important for the city to respect their time and to provide options for them to participate. Chris, you're talking about people, in some cases, who have their, their only connection with the city is through that newsletter. And that, that's why it's vitally important that what's in the newsletter isn't, just, uh, isn't dominated by feature material, but is, is really focused on the basic information. So I think one thing we can do is, following the example of the experience I've had on the executive committee in Pinecrest, trying to revitalize each neighborhood association. I know that Circle Woods is fairly inactive right now. I think it's a listserv primarily that meets once a year. When you can get a turnout at a barbecue or a block party of 60 or 80 people, as we have been doing for the past few years, that's when you figure out what do people know and what do they not know. We've invited the council members and we've invited the mayor and the police chief and the city manager to come out. And in those conversations, you can pretty clearly ascertain what level of knowledge there is from people who haven't shown up at any events and haven't been on the list serves. So I appreciate your question, Chris, and my short answer is just we've got to get out there, revitalize the neighborhood groups, and then listen and understand what information is lacking. Thanks. So I just want to make a point that uh, this is very much a, an issue of communication systems that a lot of organizations have. <laughs> um, a lot of times organizations, the city included, have methods of putting communication out there and there are some and they often have formal processes for getting information in there and then they have all and then that's the way that the different parts of the organization are meant to disseminate their information and a lot of times it, where it falls down is after the policy is made each of the individual and uh, smaller entities within the organization uh, don't follow up so that's something where I would try and make sure that each of the departments have a somebody who is making sure that they are putting any important information out there. And then if the, the city has someone centrally where that information goes to, then that information can also be used not just in the newsletter, but can go up on the website or on social media or all sorts of places. Actually, I think this, the city is doing is get, definitely getting better at social media. I, I mean, the city social media specialist, I, I think, is doing a great job. <laughs> um, I was, 
I've really noticed the difference since I ran before 2000, back in 2011 for this seat. So I think, again, that's something where if you have somebody in each of the departments whose job it is to make sure that that information that needs to be disseminated is collected and, and is then provided to a central source in the city, then, then that's the first step. And the second step is making sure that then that information gets put out through all the city's communications resources from the web to the city newsletter and certainly council, council comments. You know, I, I notice a lot of times at, at the council meetings that council members will say, and then people who are watching on city TV can see the council members say, we, there's going to be an event at this time or this this department is doing this or this department is doing that. So I think that's all a matter of just making sure that there is someone whose duty it is, job duty it is, to make sure that that information is collected and disseminated. Um, thank you. Um, well, I think Jeffrey's right. Sometimes in large organizations um, it gets complicated communicating what the work is. Um, at Advocates for Youth, as I said before, I oversee the public policy department. I, oversee, I also oversee the communications department. And I know how hard it is sometimes when people are really dedicated and passionate about their work to have them boil it down to a couple of bullet points um, because they're doing so much um, and lifting that up. So I think uh, in terms of the experience I had at Advocates working with each of our departments over the last couple of years of really helping them think through how to lift up their work and pull out the important pieces, um, you know, I'd love to work with the city manager on that as well. Um, I also feel the city manager is, you know, fairly new to us here in Tacoma Park and he has a lot to learn about um, the city, how we work, and um, all the different departments. And so I think as also as he gets to know the city and what we're doing and gets feedback, Chris, like you provided on the newsletter, uh, we can work towards better communication. Okay, thank you. Jean? Hi, I'm Jean Capps, uh, 6737 Eastern Avenue, Little Eastern on the other side of the... Um, of our district, um, uh, the I wanted to comment on some of the previous folks. I think that, with all due respect, I don't know you, so I have no axe to grind. So I'm here <laughs> because I wanted to get to know you. But with all due respect, I'm, I'm thinking you're not really getting the issues. When we're talking about aging in place, we're not talking about our parents. We're talking about us, okay? And we're talking about a few years. We want to stay in this area. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's expensive area, very high tax. I love kids. We had our own kids. Mm -hmm. They're grown up now. So as much, I'm not saying that I don't care about kids' mm -hmm. issues, but they're not the ones that are likely to get our vote. We have some very big issues uh, that I think you need to, just looking at your literature and being fair to you, I haven't had a chance to talk about, about everything. It would appear, when, when we're talking about public safety, we're not talking about sidewalks. We're talking about criminals that come sure. in and mug us and run off into the District of Columbia uh, as a kudo to recent work here done uh, across border, but that tends to come, be done for a while and be forgotten, and it's all, all of a sudden discovered as a bright new idea, you know, years later, and meanwhile, our houses get broken into, and uh, they run across the street because literally it's not just the county line, but the state line is just across the street. So that's a big issue for us, is public safety and, and, the, and, and the police. We're not, I'm not going to give any prescribed solutions to it, but it's a big issue. Um, talking about WSSC, clean up the mess, you haven't seen the mess that's coming. Uh, that's just one piece of a very much larger project which is going to impact on our area. Turns out you have, the city has no jurisdiction over WSSC. Mm -hmm. Turns out nobody owns a WSSC. But we've, we finally on our own uh, come to, uh, I would say, a working relationship with them. But the stormwater uh, management is yours. And what WSSC mm -hmm. told us after looking at the uh, sanitary sewers and the water pipes, they said, if you think retrofitting a 100-year-old sanitary sewers is a problem, you have, that's going to look like a day at the beach when they have to do these stormwater sewers. And uh, to my knowledge, I don't know if anybody's even been down. We have major um, issues down that area. So I guess what I'm seeing is 
it would be good if you kind of got out a little bit and talked to folks because the, the aging in place for us, we want to stay here, but it's going to be more than just, and I love the city services, don't get me wrong, but it's going to be more than that. It's going to be when, when people can't get around, can't, who, who brings in the social services, mm -hmm. who finds out about the financial services, what, how do you get other jurisdictions that are not the city's responsibility, but who networks with the other resources that are available to us. And we have two people that are sitting on the county council who did sit on the city council here. And there are, they are sometimes helpful and sometimes they're, they're not. So I think if, if you know what some of the key issues are, and also my husband who can't be here tonight said, tell him responsiveness is important. Mm -hmm. or, you're asked to do a tremendous amount for very little um, money. And it really, to really do the job well, you have to do a lot of it on your own time. And have you thought about that? Okay. If you boil that down to, you know, one <laughs> issue for them to respond to, okay. what would that be? Well, the most important one right now, I, I guess, would be the stormwater drainage. What, do you, what would you do differently with the fees that the city collects that makes us ineligible for any county resources having to do with stormwater drainage? I think this is uh, Jeffrey starting. Yes. Well, I remember I was at a city council meeting last year, I believe it was, where there was a discussion on a lot of those drainage sewers because they drain into Sligo Creek and there were some issues happening. Um, it wasn't, I don't think there was a lot of emphasis at that time on Ward 3 because it was further away. But I do remember some discussion of some of the issues and things that were getting caught up in those sewers, um, especially, and there was a lot of focus down here because these are the ones that are right there and go in a lot quicker. And apparently there was also a backup happening at another one um, back by the schools and they were trying to figure out where something was coming from and they figured out there was a leak you know and a pipe that barely anyone knew existed there so it's all this is to say that it's something that has to be done on a more systemic basis than I think it's been dealt with in the past and um, there, there are limited resources on that, and even if the city <coughs> figures out certain things, um, there's, they have to work with WSSC. Now, on there is stormwater drainage from the, from. Are you talking about surface stormwater drainage? Okay. Okay. Well, I. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'd have to, I have to get back to you and and talk to you more to find out exactly what, what um, to find out more about what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, Jean, for our, everything you said. And I think um, just to put another plug in for the voice, a lot of the questions that you did ask, I think all three of us um, responded to some questions that you can find on the voice. Not all of them, and I know all three of us would be available to talk in more detail. Um, I'm going to say that um, this is an area I need to do more homework. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that our city council and our community is facing. Um, I'm not going to give you an answer unless I've done my homework first. Um, and quite frankly, I, I don't have an answer for you right now. I need to talk to experts. I need to tap into the members on our city council now and the folks in our public works um, and provide you an answer. But I can promise you if I'm on the city council, I'm going to do my homework. Jean, thank you for your, your many questions. This is an area where I think I have a strength. I've studied public administration and have practiced it. <laughs> and even though I transitioned to being a teacher many years ago, I've continued to make it um, a hobby and a responsibility to read everything I can about what's happening in local government. Um, it occurred to me after Chris asked his question that my job for the city of Durham, North Carolina was educating the public about the public work services. <laughs> and I can tell you it was a challenge. It took all kinds of media to do that. Um, so I want to get back to Chris and think, brainstorm more about that. With stormwater, 
I actually helped write a stormwater management plan for Wake County, North Carolina um, while I was doing an internship for my MPA. So I pay a lot of attention to stormwater management around Tacoma Park, and I don't think we do a good job with the money that we're collecting for it. I'll give you some examples uh, that I've observed during driving rainstorms. <laughs> There, there, is, there is a new installation at the corner of Prince George's and Circle Avenues, which must have been very expensive. It, expensive. it takes up the size of a, of a home lot. And I've gone to observe it in a uh, heavy, heavy downpour, and I've seen it not filling up at all. The water's going straight down a drain that's at the bottom of that um, huge gravel and riprap construction. I've also taken a great interest in a new installation at Columbia and Poplar, which they seem to have spent a lot of money on. They keep trying to revise the formation. Two days ago in the rain snowstorm, I took a look at it. Water was overflowing and running right down the sidewalk, eroding the sidewalk, eroding the grass, the grassy median, the verge. Uh, there's also a legal uh, problem I have with people who live on Big Eastern Avenue whose water goes down into a district street but are still being charged a stormwater fee in Tacoma Park. I, I somehow don't think that's fair. We have continued to allow lots of expansion of homes in Ward 3. Roofs are getting bigger, they're stretching back, driveways are getting bigger, and the only thing we do is we ask the county to come by and permit those expansions and permit how that water is going to be handled when it hits all that impervious surface. Those, those permitting people don't have any teeth. Um, they'll approve rain gardens that never end up functioning or even being constructed. Um, they'll sign off if someone says they'll use rain barrels, but they, won't, but they never get around to using them. We need to take more responsibility locally on the front end of the stormwater problem to make sure that we're not getting greater and greater flows um, down into our low-lying neighborhoods. So believe me, I have walked the walk and I have seen the issues. Thank you. Thank you. All three of you, right? And then, okay. Yeah. Bruce. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Moyer, 6907 Westmoreland Avenue. Some of you in your opening comments referred to uh, the importance of environmental sustainability. And I'd like to ask for your views on uh, an issue that confronted the City Council during this past year in its passage of uh, the Safe Grow Ordinance, uh, legislation that uh, uh, restricts the use of herbicides and pesticides uh, by uh, homeowners, by property owners, uh, both commercial and residential in the city. This, this ordinance uh, is, is uh, breathtaking in its scope and historically one of the first uh, cities in the country to undertake uh, regulation of, of this scope. So it puts the, the city on the map in that sense. It also puts the city on the map in terms of its reach in restricting what property owners can do uh, in the exercise of, uh, of freedom and, and, and liberty. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, you, how does the city balance these two um, uh, fundamental uh, premises. One, that we should be a more environmentally sustainable uh, community. And on the other hand, uh, respecting uh, the rights of, of property owners uh, in uh, their, uh, their domain over their property. And, and lastly, in connection with that question, whether you support the Safe Grow Ordinance or whether you would favor some amendment of it, uh, and as well as how the Council went about uh, its uh, its work in uh, passing this ordinance. Thank you. Okay, and it's Kate Me? starts. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll start start at the uh, last two questions. One, um, I support the safe growth uh, grow ordinance, um, and I think the city council went about it um, appropriately. Um, to get to your question on balance, um, for me, um, respecting an individual's rights to do what they want on their property ends when it impacts other people's health and the health of our community um, here in Tacoma Park and more broadly. And I see that, that this tipped the balance in terms of needing to protect the health and well-being of our community um, 
writ large, even broader than just here in Tacoma Park. Um, so I do respect a homeowner's right to do what they want as long as that ends, what's that, the, the thing about, as long as it ends at the tip of their nose or the reach. Um, uh, and I think this is a place where it had broader implications. Um, and I think on the environment, this is a place where we need to be doing more in Tacoma Park. Um, you, I travel all over, friends are like, oh, Tacoma Park, it has this reputation of doing amazing things, being very em environmentally conscious. And I, I really don't believe we have walked the walk on that one. Um, I think we could do things um, like incentives for homeowners for solar power, home installation, um, solar cooperative, so if your home isn't appropriate for it, um, you can, you know, buy into a neighbor's home or uh, other property. And as I said before, I, we have a lot of expertise just in our ward on folks who are thinking about these issues, and I think we need to tap into them more. Uh, Bruce, um, just to respond to the last comment that Kate made, I think that one of the problems with our city's approach to sustainability has been that it's very piecemeal at this point. Um, of all the issues that you think would be most fundamental to address, um, the council spent a couple of months on this safe grow ordinance. I agree on a public health basis for the value of that ordinance. Um, and I won't go any further to explain why that is. But the ordinance is very limited in its impact. It, it excludes uh, mosquito control. It excludes any kind of insect control that may be coming into the home. And excludes the control of plants that may be a threat to human health, such as poison ivy. And a lot of people I know who live in Tacoma Park are only using herbicides or pesticides for those three purposes. So are we really serious about limiting exposure or are we trying to create visibility by an exciting initiative? This is not to say I don't approve the initiative, but I think we need to prioritize. The difference between me and the other candidates is that I'm calling for a goal-oriented approach to addressing climate change, where we as a community, not just the city government, but the city as part of a wider community would really try to commit to a goal that was sustainable in addressing climate change as well as stormwater management as well as perhaps exposure to toxic chemicals. A goal galvanizes everybody to work together. I'm talking about measuring a baseline of our carbon footprint, for example, and then saying we want to reduce this by 20 percent by such a date. How do we do this? It would begin to um, create progress in all kinds of other aspirations that we have. For example, we want the police to get out of their cars and be on foot and on bikes more, right? Right? Everybody asks for that. That would necessitate that, you know? We want jobs for youth. Um, great early employment would be efficiency audits, efficiency improvements, delivery services, and if we could begin to plant an urban orchard, as some cities out west have done, gleaning cooperatives uh, to glean nuts and fruits from trees that we're growing. These are not outlandish proposals. We would definitely have to figure out on a regulatory basis how to make a solar cooperative happen. If we can just do it once on one new building, maybe at Tacoma Junction, then that would be replicable. It's very important that we in Tacoma Park do this. This is, climate change is an existential threat to our town greater than the freeway ever was. I'm sorry, this is what everybody's telling us. It's a threat to everyone. We've got to do more and we have to recognize that we have a multiplier effect because what we do gets attention because of who we are. Thanks. All right, going back uh, specifically to the safe grow and the balance of environment and property rights. Um, I think the balance is, it's a very tough line to draw where that balance is. Um, I, in this particular instance, I mean, I'm very supportive of the idea, but enforcement is, is tough. Um, I mean, if you look at it, it's like a number of other ordinances that we have and that the county has about private property and uh, the right-of-ways right in front, like sidewalks. There are rules about property owners having to keep the sidewalks in front of their property clear. There are rules about uh, 
upkeep of the property, uh, about uh, not parking your car, blocking, you know, your sidewalk, the sidewalk, or anything like that. And these things generally only get enforced when somebody complains. And I myself, you know, having seen a lot of this, have never complained to, you know, so, you know, the ones that I really care about have never been enforced because, you know, there's nobody go and enforcing pesticides would be even harder because unless it's a like a private company that puts that sign on the lawn that says do not, you know, just treat it, do not uh, come on this grass, there's really no way to know. And so that's that's the one issue there. And the other thing is we already do, in, on a general basis as, as a government, infringe on property rights in all sorts of ways. So it's all about deciding what's, what's the proper one. And, and it's sometimes you just have to look on an individual basis. In this case, I think it's a worthy idea, but I don't think the city is going to put the resources that would be needed in terms of enforcing it. But just to give you some examples of those other ways that the government infringes on your property rights way more than this is zoning condemning unsafe uh, properties, property tax, um, are, just th are just three that I, that I can name. So I'll leave it at that. All right. Next. Jeff Trunzo, Sherman Avenue. So uh, I do have a question about um, community reinvestment. But first, I wanted to make a comment uh, since um, we had a thread about stormwater management and tax duplication. So. Um, Unintended consequences are something that I think always need um, a little bit more attention to in the city. For instance, we decided that it, w it was a good thing to do to manage our own stormwater. However, by doing so, all Tacoma Park residents are not eligible for Montgomery County's Rainscape rebate program for doing things about stormwater. So I think. Not, not only do we have a tax duplication problem, but we have a lack of respect, and I'm not sure we always do the math right about unintended consequences. I got that off my chest. You can tell <laughs> I've spent money on one. <laughs> so the, my question is about community reinvestment and revitalization. Um, this is something that I hold um, uh, very close to my heart because I, I do a lot of work with uh, OTBA, and I feel very strongly that we have great diverse community and we want community reinvestment and renewal in ways that serve all the citizens and I, and I think having um, modern up-to-date well-managed properties both residential and commercial is an asset that benefits everyone one area that I think we have not been successful in is developing a program for small community shopping centers and I'm talking about these little isolated pocket commercial areas like at Sherman and Maple. Of course, that one affects me. But we have many of them, Flower and Erie, all over the place. So, um, you know, we're putting a lot of effort into the new avenue on New Hampshire Avenue. We have a, we have a nice model, partly driven by demographics and other things that's happening in Old Town. I'd like to see us create some sort of program or fund so that we can bring all commercial properties under some type of redevelopment umbrella and improve everything across the city. And this could have lots of impact for sustainability. For instance, people could walk to the market at the corner of their street. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, we're up to so Roger. What was the question there? Yeah, what was the question? How can we make this happen more better, faster. Okay. How can we make that happen more, better, faster? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't want to give a facile answer, Jeff. More, better, faster. I'm going to say again that if we can set a bold goal for sustainability and reducing our carbon footprint, that's going to drive these other, these other issues. If we say if you ask someone, pull out all your receipts from the last month, where did you spend your money? Think about if you could do that. How much of that money did you spend in Prince George's County? How much did you spend outside of Tacoma Park in Montgomery County? How much did you spend in the district? Why did you spend it there? 
and when you were hauling it back, whatever you bought, either in your stomach or in your car or both, right? What if the goal was, you know, we can survey. We want the average Tacoma Park resident to spend 60% of their, what do you call it, disposable income in town. All of a sudden, we start looking at little places like the VFW Hall in my neighborhood. Why can't they have a little side room with, with some groceries there? Or we start looking at New Hampshire Avenue in my neighborhood, a commercial district in Tacoma Park, in Ward 3, which is larger in area and probably larger in revenue already than the junction. And we start thinking, why is there a white elephant building there still? Like, what, what kind of ways could we increase the demand for that office building that's empty? You know? um, we're hungry for places to go eat by walking up the street. That's why we're trying to get our sidewalk network completed in our neighborhood. I think we have to look at the sidewalk network. I think we have to look at um, the possibility of investing, of allowing Tacoma Park residents to um, participate in B corporations or other forms of local community investment. And I know some vehicles for that are being worked out. And I think we need to think about the interplay among the different nodes in our community and how to make them complement each other. Um, one of the points I hope to make tonight, and I have a handout about it if I don't get to make it, is that I'm very, very well prepared to jump in with this upcoming T Tacoma Junction revitalization question as the city prepares to sell that big parking lot to a developer. I know all the ins and outs of that. I've, it's, it's part of my nature that I really want to learn all the facts on the ground. I've talked to the business owners at Flower and Erie about what is it that they're doing. Have they ever thought about uh, having some sandwiches and setting some tables outside? So it's linking up neighborhood demand with the local business owners. And if there's a need for some funding, uh, talk to Pizza Roma. Um, could we fund them to have some nicer tables? Is there a way we could have a rotating fund through OTBA to try to make the improvements that the local market is interested in. So those are just some of my ideas. I'm just going to focus on three points. Uh, the first is, yes, there have been a lot of exciting uh, developments in terms of funding different projects uh, based on new legislation that the state legislature has just passed in this session, sec session about uh, crowdsourcing. So that's definitely something, and that was pushed very hard by residents of Tacoma Park. So I think that's definitely a resource we can work on, you know, making sure that the the funds that people in the city have that they feel, you know, hey, we can help. I would want to, I would want to invest in bringing this or that service or business to the city, you know, that there's now a great vehicle for doing that. Uh, second, uh, the city is been doing this food truck initiative on Fridays and that required a lot of work on looking at the existing regulations and things like that so so that's another thing that has to be done is we have to look at our existing regulations for businesses and see if there are certain things we can do to encourage the type of development that we want by making some changes there and then finally you know of course we do have community grants that we do and there might be ways if there are specific businesses that are here or specific properties that we'd like to see businesses in or specific type of businesses in that there might be a way of the city doing something to help make sure that property is ready for that type of business or to make sure that business is has the funds it needs to to make a change to move towards from maybe the way they are now to what the community you know would like even more so those are just three ways that the city, you know, can look th three three things the city can look at in terms of trying to make a difference for those businesses and making sure that there are businesses that people can get to, you know, in their neighborhoods and not too far out of their neighborhoods. Um, so I think it's a great question um, and something we need to look at. Uh, smart growth studies find that um, you need grocery stores or food stores within a three block radius of a person's home for them actually to walk there versus drive and purchase food. So I think, Jeff, your idea of having these small pockets 
uh, is is exactly right on point, especially if we are going to tackle things like our carbon footprint here in Tacoma Park. Um, I think there are a number of ways um, they were spoken about. The Tacoma Park notes is one thing that old um, old town. Uh, Business Association is looking in, into now, and I think it's a great idea. Basically, the way this is going to work is that um, residents in the community would be able to invest in local businesses. It would be high risk, and it's not for everybody. But each of us could have basically an investment, a stake in a local business. And I think those are the type of innovative ideas that are going to help us revitalize these pockets. I think underscoring um, your question is really gets at what kind of community we want to live in um, and the diversity and our, can, keeping our unique character. Um, and it goes back to what I said in my opening about making sure that our development and how we go about it here in Tacoma Park, we don't become a Bethesda light. And really what I, I mean by that is keeping our unique character. You know, I know many of us benefit from having republics downtown, republic downtown. I, you know, I like going there, um, but it's not for, it doesn't necessarily serve everybody in our community. I think there are ways, like the community kitchen at the Presbyterian Church, that will service a number of folks in our community by providing them the resources in a, ki a kitchen to cook and sell their food, um, either at the farmer's market or at the food co-op. There are ideas like bi uh, business uh, incubators, um, we talked about the building on New Hampshire Avenue. That's, this, I know the city council has uh, raised this last year, but that's a great place where you ha if you have a large building, you don't have a lot of adornments or anything, people can go in, you have a starter business, you pay a very small fee, but you're you know, pooling resources, facilities, um, and you're allowed to stay there a couple of years. Um, I think. Two, I, two years was the idea that was originally floated so that you have a chance to grow your business and you're provided with those resources. Um, so I think there have been a lot of great ideas that are floating around and bringing them together to really focus on not only the junction and Old Town, but the small park pockets is a great idea. Very good. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> oh, no, Lois is getting in there. Can we My do name two is more Cynthia if we Terrell. agree to be brief? Yeah, yeah, if okay. you agree to be brief, sure. Okay. My name is Cynthia Terrell. I live on Jackson Avenue. And uh, I have a question that's directed for, to Roger and Jeffrey. Curious whether you have any reservations about running for this seat, um, given that if one of you gets elected, it'll be an all-male council. And I'd like to know what you think the downsides of an all-male council are. And if it's something that you care about, what uh, should you be doing as council members or community members to change that? And on a scale of 1 to 10, how important you think it is to have parity for women, representation of economic and ethnic and racial diversities on the council? Good luck keeping that short. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we start with, with Jeffrey. Okay. Well, I think the biggest point for me is when I look at that question, I'm thinking not just it, – it's a diversity question, and there are many types of diversity. And yes, it's unfortunate that there are some types of diversity that we're not seeing on the council, and there's certainly ways that we can, steps that we can take. Um, one thing that's been discussed uh, on the voting task force that I was a co-chair of before I began my campaign, is, and that may be one of their recommendations and I think is a good idea, is to have people who have been candidates in the past or who have formerly been members of the council holding forums, or not really forums, but more informal sessions with people who might be interested in running, you know, kind of to, to dispel some of the things that might be discomfort for them, because um, a lot of people have reservations, and, and letting them know what, it, what it's like so that, you know, we hopefully have more people running. I mean, a lot of the issue is self-selection in who's run in, in the races. So um, if, if we can get out there and have more opportunities to encourage people to run, then I think that will help. But in terms of the diversity as it is now, I think I bring a number of different uh, diversity factors to the council. One is age. I'd certainly be the youngest member of the council. 
and I'm also a Montgomery County government employee, so I bring an experience of actually working for a local government that I could bring towards as a perspective. Having grown up in the city and been here my entire life, that's something where that's a perspective Kay brought essentially as a native Tacoma Parker, and I can continue. So those are just three examples of diversity that I can bring. They may not be gender, but uh, again, that comes down to which types of diversity do you feel in voting are most important to be reflected on the council. And, you know, in, on my part, I just feel I can offer something to the council, and that's why I'm running. Do you think it's a problem for Tacoma Park to have an all-male council? I think if we see it as an image, image issue, it's something that, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a problem to have an all-male council if that's who the voters have selected. You know, but we should encourage more people to run from different backgrounds and more women and more minorities in the future. But given who we have running, you know, the voters can make their selection based on that. Okay. That was three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that would be you? Oh, yes. Okay. So, okay. Um, oh. The question was I, just for Rodney. I don't know. I, yeah. What? From everybody. Yeah. It's here. From yeah. Everybody. Okay. All right. Um, so I think it is important to have more women running in, um, for office and sitting on the city council as Jeffrey says, I, I think we have to think of uh, ways to get more diversity um, across the city council. Absolutely. Um, in the work that I do working with young people, I have found that, and studies bear this out, that the best way to have them empowered and taking positions and advocating on the behalf of themselves is to have role models and to have people out there that they can look up to and see, yeah, that person looks like me, that person's like me, I can do that too. Um, so I think diversity, um, as we said, in all its different forms is very important to have on our city council. Um, but again, we'll let the voters decide. Very good. Okay, Roger. Yes, I, I think that the possibility of an all-male Tacoma Park City Council is a legitimate concern. And I would respect anyone who felt that that was a priority for them that trumped everything else. For me personally, I thought very, very carefully about that. I discussed it with my wife, with my um, friends in Pinecrest, with people on the street, and I waited. I was interested in running, but I waited. Um, I did have a chance to talk with Kate, and with all due respect, mm -hmm. I, I had some different perspectives on things. Mm -hmm. So then I asked around my neighborhood, and there's someone sitting in this room whom I asked, um, actually we brought it up at a Pinecrest meeting, was there anyone who wanted to run? And I waited for that person to think it through. Um, she decided not, she in fact said, Roger, I want you to run. When I talked to a number of neighbors of mine who were women, they all said, Roger, you can't worry about this. You have the experience that Ward 3 needs right now. Um, let the chips fall where they will. Ward 3 doesn't have to be responsible for the choices made by other wards. It doesn't have to have its choices restricted. So I'm left in this difficult situation of asking for your vote, knowing that if I am elected, um, we'll end up with something that's very awkward and something that we don't think represents our community. So where do we go from there? Well, it might be that we go to some place better quicker. Um, sometimes we've been through periods where we had what you would consider, in looking at the city website, a token female council member. Is that really all we need is just one? Uh, I think we need more than one. I think I do favor parity. So, and I don't think it's the same kind, it's a different kind of diversity from others, and I think we need to pay attention to that. So maybe, if you elected me to finish Kay's term, the embarrassment would be so great for the city <laughs> that it would galvanize a number of women um, to step in, even though, even though it's difficult to step into a race because there's a, there's a hidden power structure that determines who runs in races, and we know that, right? And ask yourself, what's the gender of that hidden power structure? Who holds the power in that group? You know, that's an important thing for us to think about, too. 
So I think, again, if we revitalize neighborhood organizations, we get new talent, new voices into the mix. And we will have someone running from a neighborhood like Pinecrest in a few years who's a woman. I'm convinced of it. Okay, if we go with the final statements now, we'll finish on time. I'm up for it, yeah. Fine. One more question. It's, it's sure. not a council meeting, but we could go till 11, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I it's, promise I'm I'll sure, make I'm it I'm not sure about the TV, how the TV crew right. feels about that. Yeah. Okay. I promise I'll make it quick, even though I'm usually long-winded. Um, I'm Lois Wessel. I live on Westmoreland Avenue. Um, and I, want, I think that in addition to the safe growth, there are two things that make Tacoma Park and voting in Tacoma Park specifically very unique and, are, and fairly new to Tacoma Park. One of them is the instant runoff voting, which could come into play in this election. Um, and the other is the youth vote. In uh, 2013, there were more 16 and 7-year-olds, 16 and 17-year-olds who voted than all of the people ages 18 to 30. Um, combined in the election. So I want to know um, what you all think of instant runoff voting and how you think it will play out in this election and what you think about um, engaging youth and how you think the youth vote will play out in this election. Who's first here? Who's um, first? I think it's Jeffrey. Isn't it? I thought I was first on the last one. Were you? I guess I forgot to write it down. In that case, okay. it's Kate. I can go. Um, I'm going to do 16 and 17. Run the runoff voting, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I have anything to say on the reporting, quite frankly. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's our system. Um, people have looked at it. I think it's um, important that we come to, you know, we'll know election night um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see how things fall. Um, I, I actually would like to spend more, since we only have a little time left, talking about the 16 and 17 year old voting, because I actually think that is a, a place that. Um, we don't all agree, actually. Who, uh, there's a lot of commonality, and I actually think this is a place where we differ. Um, so I was very supportive when uh, the council was looking at this issue um, for 16 and 17 year olds to vote. Um, as I said before, I work in an organization that works with young people. Uh, we actually work with young people from the age of 14 up to the age of 24. Um, I've seen that when you provide the tools and you empower young people and you set high expectations, they meet those high expectations when you provide them the support. Um, I think all the research bears out that voting is habitual. You start doing it and you tend to continue doing it. Um, and the research also bears out that if you, the earlier you start to vote, the more likely you are to continue that and to do it um, as you get older. I think in terms of building, again, one of my core goals is building a sustainable future here in Tacoma Park. That means increasing civic engagement across the city. Um, having young people get involved in our city elections, knowing the candidates, knowing about the policies that impact our community, I think benefits all of us. So I'm very supportive of it. Okay. Um, Roger? Well, uh, the first question was about instant runoff voting. Um, I'm hoping that both my candidates will tell their supporters that <laughs> I'm, I ought to be the second choice. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I'll be everyone's first choice. Uh, with, I, and I don't want to prognosticate about what the impact of it will be in this election because I think we have a lot of politically connected people in Tacoma Park on the national and state and county level, and we tend to over-politicize these elections, we turn them into a kind of a sport or entertainment when they're really about bread and butter issues. And I, I would like to encourage a culture that looks at it that way. Um, in terms of the 16-year-old vote, um, that gives me a great advantage as a high school teacher. Um, a former student of mine saw me today uh, and said, I haven't divulged where the place, at the place I teach at that there's this election going on and have this other life um, but she said, Mr. Schlegel, I saw on Facebook that you're running for city council, and so now, um, you know, we're all going to like you. And <laughs> <laughs> so apparently I have a lot more likes on the Facebook page. It makes me a little concerned because there are some, it's a, it's a private school, but there are some students who live in Tacoma Park. I don't want them voting for me as a popularity contest. And, and I think as grown-ups in Tacoma Park, we need to be careful not to vote on the basis of popularity or social circles. There, there are a lot of interconnected social circles. And if that's how we play out our elections, we're not going to get the results we want. 
I'm not a very socially connected person in some parts of the ward in terms of dinner parties, um, teams that my kids are on, that sort of thing. So I need voters to listen to my ideas and observe my experience and think about my readiness to do this job. That's the same thing with 16 and 17 year olds. I, I want to make sure they're making independent choices and I, I put that on my uh, comments on The Voice, I, a specific note to 16 or 17 year olds. Make sure you're not mimicking what your parents think or what your teachers think. Uh, make sure you're making your own decisions. So I agree with Kate that they can do that, but it's an education that's involved there, and we need to educate ourselves too. Okay. All right. Well, I'm actually going to focus more on the IRV. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but just talking about being connected in social cir circles in a popularity contest. I know if it's that, I'm coming in third. <laughs> but, but I hope people will listen to me in my campaigning and everything else, you know. I know, a lot, I know a lot of people in the city, you know, unfortunately my base of support isn't necessarily all in Ward 3 <laughs> in terms of people who know me and, and w I, who I might win a popularity contest with. Um, so there's that. Um, in terms of 16 and 17 year olds, I'm definitely supportive of the idea and uh, the council actually, when they pass that, they're like, you know, we're willing to let them vote, but now that they're registered voters, if we didn't, if we don't change things, they can actually be elected, and so we don't want that. So they changed the a the you know there was no minimum age to be elected; you just had to be a registered voter before. But now the now when they made that change, the council made that change. They said you got to be 18, and I think if a 16 and seven or 17 year old felt mature enough to run and could get enough votes to win, who, who is the existing council to say that that person is not mature enough? I think, they, you know, they've demonstrated a lot of maturity and ability to handle issues. There have been sit, smaller cities in other parts of the country that have elected, and this was, this was in places where the 16 or 17 year olds couldn't vote where the 16 or 17 year old got elected. So, you know, I would, I would even support that. And then in terms of IRV, I'm very proud to have been an election judge the year we've, the city voted on the uh, proposal for the charter change to put that in place. I was also an election judge in the special election in 2005, which was the only year that IRV actually had to be used where no one had a majority in the first, in first choice votes. And so we looked at the second choice votes of the person who came in third. And that con in that case, that confirmed the results of of the first round, this, you know, it was Jared Smith. He came out, you know, ahead in the first round and in the second round. And so I, I'm definitely supportive of that. And basically the way it works is you will rank, if you want to rank somebody as a second or third choice, you can do that. And what happens if nobody gets a majority of first choice votes, the person who comes in third in those first choice votes will be eliminated and then they will look at the second choice votes on the ballots of those people. And so the, those will then be distributed to the other two candidates. And then whoever then has a majority after that will be the winner. Basically it ensures that it's not so much an issue here in the city of Tacoma Park in that there will be one candidate where, you know, they have enough support to come in first in the first round in a plurality, but that they don't have enough, but that a significant number of people really don't want them. But that's, that's basically what it's for, is to prevent somebody who's really disliked from winning. <laughs> <laughs> beep, beep, beep. <laughs> so anyway, I hope you would sh choose me with either your first or second choice. <laughs> okay, um, so no closing statements? Closing statements. Closing statements, okay. I'm going to ask yeah. you to keep them short. Yeah. Because okay. we're mm -hmm. sure. over time. And uh, well, we started about six minutes late, so we've got about a well, short, short amount of time. Um, and uh, I, I do have some announcements following that if people want to hear those. I'm, well, even if you don't. Okay, uh, we'll start in reverse order. We'll start okay. with Kate. Okay. Great. Well, thank you again, everyone, for coming tonight and sticking with us um, this late. Um, so, as I said in my opening, we have a number of great opportunities and challenges facing us uh, in the next couple of months and the next couple of years here in Tacoma Park. Um, with the experience I bring, um, with my love of this community, 
I'm ready to hit the ground running. Um, the person who is going to occupy the city council seat will be thrown right into the budget. Um, I just got done doing the budget at uh, the nonprofit I work at. I'm ready to do another budget um, and uh, get going on that. Um, the other thing is that in my private and public life, um, I'm a person who listens very hard to what people have to say, their concerns, but I'm also somebody who then acts and can move things. And I think that's what our city council also needs right now. Somebody who will listen to the concerns of the neighbors and the community, but then will also put things in motion and act. And so I ask you to vote for me come next, come Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So next will be Jeffrey. All right. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out and for anyone who's watching on TV or who might be watching this on a rerun uh, later in the week on City Cable. And I'd also like to, of course, thank again Wacko and Circle Woods and The Voice for putting together this forum. And I'd just like to note that uh, my position actually with the uh, Montgomery County government is fiscal assistant. So, you know, I actually have more experience with the putting the budget, implementing the budget than creating it. And so I think that perspective is important because I think a lot of times the implementation part is not always understood and so it needs to be, needs to be looked at in terms of writing it to make sure it's realistic. I'm also actually, um, I'd like to mention a shop steward with, uh, in Montgomery County government and as, as I said, that's Department of Health and Human Services. And then finally, uh, just going to give, for the, for the people who are here, you can look up my websites on my literature, which is over on the table by the door. But for those who are watching on TV, uh, if you Google Jeff and N for Ward 3, all one word, J-E-F-F-N-N-F-O-R-W-A-R-D 3, you will find... Probably most likely my Facebook page, my Twitter page, and uh, my campaign page, so you can look up uh, my information all in all of those. So again, uh, please vote for me first. <laughs> choice vote. And if you prefer someone else as your first choice, I would ask you to consider me for your second choice as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Roger? Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. I said at the outset that I was going to try to show you this evening that I was the best candidate for, to finish Kay's term and represent Ward 3. I hope that I've done that. I, I tried to show that I'm very experienced on local issues right now. I'm very fair-minded. Those of you who have worked with me on the City Manager Selection Task Force and on the arduous process of the Tacoma Junction Task Force know that I prized getting stakeholder input. I worked closely with Kay Daniels Cohn and Megan Gallagher on that for months and then I advocated for the continued involvement of those stakeholder comments in every deliberation of the task force straight through to the end when I took the lead in writing the report. I'm tireless in my belief that all progress to be sustainable must be collective. It has to involve many, many more people in our city than we're sitting in the room right now. And my approach of being fair-minded and giving, trying to give everyone an equal voice even the people who can't make it to meetings, is the way we need to move forward. At the same time, I'm well connected and comfortable working with the council members and with the city manager, uh, whom I got to know when I gave him a tour of our fine community and uh, when I served on the task force. I think he's doing an excellent job, and I would look forward to settling in and working with him. We did not talk in detail about two things that are important to me. I'll just mention them quickly. You can read about them. Program budgeting is, in general, the need to, the idea of setting goals with your budget that you review from year to year. I think it could be a tremendous way for us to save money um, and be more effective and fair in the spending of our dollars over the years and prioritize our needs. Second, Tacoma Junction. It's the biggest issue to affect our ward um, in the past several years and over the foreseeable future. And a decision is going to be made by the council over the next six months about the fate of the city-owned lot. I didn't intend for it to be the case, but because of what I did on the task force, and you can talk to the people who were on that task force, 
I ended up being the person who's most knowledgeable about every back corner of that issue, all the intersecting um, trade-offs involved, the traffic, the parking, pedestrian bike access, the market needs, historic district, aesthetic concerns, um, traffic 30 impacts. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. And I think it might be that if you, I left a handout over there, if, and you can read about it on the website and the voice questions. If you think carefully, it might be that that issue, even though it, it's a sleepy time right now, we're just waiting for the RFPs uh, to be um, responded to by potential developers, that issue is going to be looming so large over the next few months that you need someone who, who doesn't have to learn on the job. So please think for yourself, be independent, and entrust me with your vote. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, so just, yes, I, so you see what I mean? Uh, we've got some, three very capable candidates here. It's going to be a hard choice. Uh, so um, some announcements real quick. Uh, if you want to know more about the candidates, we have a lot more on our, <laughs> on our uh, voter's guide on the, at the Tacoma Voice. It's uh, www.tacoma.com. Uh, the, the city website also has uh, a lot of information about voting and where to go and all that kind of stuff. Just briefly, let me just tell you again, the voting place is at the fire department, not here at the city council um, at the community center. And that's on Carroll Avenue. The room is in the lower level of the station. Parking is available on the lower level of the fire station or the city next to the co-op. There's also some uh, Sunday and Monday on the April 6th and 7th. There's early voting here at the community center. Uh, you can find all the times and dates uh, online. Okay, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you.